the artificial passive immunity, artificial active immunity. We'll be talking about all that today, all right? So since we're talking about immunizations, these are more artificial means of acquiring immunity because if you get an immunization, you are not really acquiring the illness the natural way, right? You didn't get it from somebody else. You basically got a shot in your arm. So it's artificial. But even though it's artificial, it can either be active, meaning what it stimulates your body to make its own antibodies, right? Or it can be passive, meaning you actually get what? Preformed antibodies. Okay, we'll talk all about that today. Okay, yeah. So I just talked about that, right? Oh, wow, well, good. Okay, so I can move on, right? I just talked about that. We got to get early today. I'm real tired. Okay, now real quick. Here's a brief history on immunization. Okay, it started with the Chinese, like most everything else, like fireworks and all that good stuff. Okay, so the Chinese noticed, I mean, early on, they noticed that children who got smallpox, they actually survived. So the children who survived smallpox, and okay, they didn't die from it, they never got it again. So they noticed that, right? So they said, okay, here's the deal. If a child gets smallpox, they actually took the scabs from that child's scars and purposely put the scab on another child to give that second child smallpox because they wanted that child to basically get smallpox so they never get it again. Now it worked. It did work. However, some children actually died. They did not. Some died. Some got immunity, right? But if they did not get immunity, they actually succumbed to smallpox. Now that process where you deliberately expose someone to a pathogen like that, deliberately for the sake of provide immunity, that is called variolation. So variolation is where you purposely infect someone with some pathogen, like smallpox, for the whole sake of develop developing immunity, okay? But that's bad because you might end up dying from that. Now, the English and the Americans, okay, back in the 1700s, they're like, oh, this is pretty cool, let's try that. But they realized, okay, some children were dying from smallpox, so they actually outlawed it in England, and they outlawed it in the colony because they're like, well, people are dying from this. This is not ethical, right? It's not ethical, so they stopped that in the 1700s, okay? Now, 1796, we talked about Edward Jenner, right? Did we talk about him? Way back in chapter one? Okay, so he figured it out. So he's still concerned with smallpox. He just did some observations. So basically, he observed that milkmaids, right? had cowpox. Cowpox is very similar to smallpox, but it's less virulent, okay, it's less virulent. So these milkmaids basically got sores on their hands, right? But that was it, the sores would go away. But they never, ever got smallpox. So if you got cowpox, you had immunity against smallpox, and Edward Jenner realized that. And I told you about that story, he purposely gave a boy cowpox. So he did also what? Virulation. So he purposely gave a boy cowpox, and the boy was fine, right? Because you don't die from cowpox. But he realized that boy was now immune to smallpox. So that's where we get the word vaccinization, okay? Because the word vacca means cow and lactic, okay? It came from cowpox, makes sense? It came from cowpox. So vaccinization comes from basically Edward Jenner using cowpox to inoculate people to prevent them from getting smallpox, all right? Now, Louis Pasteur, he also developed some vaccines, okay? The first one he did was against Pasteurella multicida. And you're like, what the heck is this? Okay, that particular bacteria really causes foul cholera in birds, but it's a zoonotic disease, which means what? You can get it too, right? So it can go to people as well. So he developed a vaccine against Pastrella multicida. So it's a zoonotic disease found in birds, but it can cross over to humans, okay? And not too long after that, he also developed vaccines against anthrax and also rabies, okay? But this was the first one he did. Now, not too long after that, people realized that you can actually use antibodies to give people immunity. So right now, Pasteur and Jenner, they use actual organisms, okay? They use organisms to stimulate immunity. But not too long after that, people realize you don't need the organism to do it. All you need really is some antibodies to give someone immunity against that pathogen, okay? Now, of course, that is what? Passive immunity, right? Because you're using antibodies to do it. Now let's take a look at the actual effect of immunization in this country against two diseases that's not really prevalent anymore, okay? Take a look at the charts, all right? The first
first one is looking at polio. All right. Now, most of you probably weren't around when polio was a really scary, scary disease, okay? Because if you got it, A, you either got paralyzed, B, you had difficulty breathing, or you may even die from it, okay? So polio was a big deal back in the 50s and previous to that, okay? It was very scary, all right? Look at the incidence, right? Uh, really the prevalence, like the prevalence of polio back in the 1950s, right? 40,000 cases, right? You may end up with polio if you were back in that day, right? Why? Because there were no vaccines against polio in that era, right? Okay. Well, let's see. So with the introduction of the first vaccine against polio right here, look at that. Woo. Maybe about 5,000 cases by maybe 1958, right? That's in the whole U.S. Like, this is not just Port St. Louis. This is the whole country. Makes sense? That's not bad, right? That's not bad. Look where you introduced the second vaccine against polio, right? Look at that. Down to nothing. Down to nothing. So basically, we still get vaccinated today against polio, right? We still do that. But pretty much, polio is not a big deal anymore. I mean, it's almost eradicated. In this country, right? in this country, okay, not in the whole world, but at least in the U.S., polio is said to be almost eradicated. So you have no fear of getting polio ever again. Now let's look at measles, for example. Some of you who may be a little older, you may have had measles, okay? Look at the timeline here. 1950s, 1960s, even in the 70s, right? Look at that. Okay. This is now thousands, 200,000, 400,000. A lot of people back in these days got the measles, right? My dad had the measles. Well, look at the introduction of that vaccine, right? So after we enter the vaccine, after 1960, right, we get a decline of the measles. Now here's the deal. Is measles eradicated in the U.S.? No, not really, right? There's a low prevalence of it, but it's not totally eradicated, okay? But that's all from what? <coughs> Just vaccination, right? That's it. It's a big deal. It works. Oh, gee. What is that? Dang, so right when they, yeah. you missed it. You missed I the cutoff. Oh, no. What was that face? I, I don't know what that was. Measles? Yeah. It's, a, it's like chicken pox. You just get rashed all over your body. You feel sick, tired. It's like chicken pox. But it's just a different vibe. Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. Now, here's the deal. This slide is telling you, even though we see from the previous slide that vaccines are good, right? Well, not everybody can get a vaccine, okay? So there are many people in the world that don't have access to these simple vaccines that we have in this country, like against polio and measles. I said before, right? These diseases are almost eradicated in this country, but not in other places, right? Here's the deal. So in many developing nations, right? They don't get the vaccines. It could be political reasons, right? It could be economical reasons. It could be social reasons, right? But for whatever reason, the vaccine is available, but they're just not providing it for their people. So a lot of children in different countries, they still get things like pertussis and diphtheria that many kids in this country never ever see, okay? Also, some pathogens we just don't have a vaccine for, like HIV, right? It's been almost 20 years, right? Since we found out about HIV, and as of today, there is no vaccine against HIV. Now, the cold virus has been around for forever, right? And there's still not a vaccine against the cold virus. You know why? Changing. Well, it's Mutation. always changing, right? Because viruses have a tendency to always mutate their genome, which means you may have a vaccine against the cold virus, but next year it's going to be different anyway, and that's why you need a whole new vaccine. So in other words, that's why you need a flu shot every single year, because the flu virus is changing its genome every single year. Now, with the deal with in, not influenza, the deal with the cold virus, there are 200 plus viruses that can actually cause the cold. Which means you need at least, right, minimum, right? Minimum you need at least what? 200 different vaccines against every type of virus that could potentially cause cold. So that's not going to happen, right? Not going to happen. Down here is talking about vaccine-associated risk, meaning A, the cost, meaning the financial cost to actually develop, research, produce a vaccine, right? It's very costly. And also the medical risk, meaning some people can actually react to that vaccine, right? Which may cause a potential lawsuit, which means that company loses money, right? Because of that, vaccine business is not big business, right? Drugs, yes, drugs is big money. 
but not really a vaccine developed, okay? All right, let's go through the different kinds of vaccines. First, we'll talk about active immunization. When we say active, what does that mean? Your body. body is actually making antibodies against that antigen or actually the pathogen. Very good. Real quick. First one is attenuated or basically a live vaccine. Yeah, okay. So attenuated means it's a live vaccine, meaning the pathogen is there and it's alive. Okay. It's functional, right? but it's been weakened. So attenuated means that pathogen is in a weakened form, but it has the potential for making you sick, depending on who you are, okay? Let's see, blah, 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 talked about that. It can cause a mild infection, okay? Now, it's good to use an active microbe because an active microbe can actually do what in your body? Thrive. What's that? Stimulate. Say it louder. Thrive. What do you mean by thrive? Live. What do you mean by live? Colonize. Uh, Colonize. So grow, right? Multiply. Reproduce, right? So if the microbe is alive in your body, it's going to do what? It's going to multiply, which means it's going to give you a stronger immune response. Make sense? Because it's actually thriving, meaning it's multiplying in you. Got it? So it produces a very strong immune response. Now, these attenuated vaccines, they can actually provide what we call contact immunity. Now, contact immunity basically means that, right? In other words, you get, for example, the flu vaccine that was attenuated and you came down with the case of the flu. In your household, everyone else got the flu because of you, but guess what? Now everyone, you and everyone in your house, because you now have that flu virus, you are now immune against that strain of the flu, make sense? It's called contact immunity. You get the flu, everybody else in your house gets it from you, but now when you get better, everyone is now immune to, here's the key word, that strain of the flu virus, right? That's contact immunity. Now, these uh, inactive, not inactive, they're modified or weakened, let's say weakened, right, because they're living, right, but they're weakened, okay. they may have enough residual activity so that you may get sick. So someone last class asked me, with the flu virus, you get sick, what happened? Well, A, it was an attenuated flu vaccine, which means that virus was still somewhat active and has the potential to come back in full force to actually give you the when you get immunized against these viruses, do they tell you if it's attenuated vaccine or not? They should. They should. Right. That would be nice. They, they are might. supposed to get, every time you get a vaccine, they're supposed okay. to give you a little handout about your vaccine. Is it attenuated or inactivated? If you don't okay. get a handout, you should ask for it, but they normally give you a handout okay. whenever you get a shot, literally. And then you just have to read it. They may not tell you. You just have to read it for yourself, and it will say attenuated or inactive. It will say that on your sheet, okay? So ask for it. Ask for your sheet. Got it? They don't give it to you? No. They're supposed to? No. We get vaccine that works. Like, every, like, like, two or three times. Yeah. 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 Y
Now you got two forms of inactivated vaccines. It could be whole agent vaccine, which really means it's the whole virus or it's the whole bacteria. It's the whole pathogen in the intact form in that vaccine, or you can have subunits of them, okay? You can have bits and pieces of them, just enough, right, to stimulate an immune response. Now, both are safer than live vaccines because they're not supposed to make you sick, okay? Because those organisms or the virus, they are dead. Now, it's not as good, though. It's not as good as the attenuated vaccines because, again, they're not living inside of you. They produce a weaker immune response, which means, A, if you get an inactivated vaccine, you either need multiple doses or you need a booster shot. Makes sense? Right? These guys still make your body develop antibodies, but again, since those microbes or the virus is not actively growing inside of you, you need multiple doses or booster shots to stimulate the maximum immunity. Like the HEP-B. HEP-B or even DTAP, tetanus, you gotta get booster shots. All right. Now, because they're not very useful to stimulate a strong immune response, sometimes they can take adjuvant, okay? So some inactivated vaccines, they will contain adjuvant. And again, on that piece of paper, they will tell you whether your vaccine has an adjuvant. Now, an adjuvant is simply a chemical that helps to stimulate your immune response. And why am I telling you this? Because sometimes adjuvant can cause a bad reaction, too. These are chemicals. These are chemicals that kind of help boost the vaccine potency in your body. And that piece of paper you're supposed to get will tell you whether there's adjuvants in there or not. If you have a bad reaction, for example, it may be due to the adjuvants in the vaccine and not the vaccine itself. Make sense? So adjuvants are chemicals in inactivated vaccines that help stimulate the response in your body. Now, toxoid vaccines are simply that. They are vaccines against a toxin. Now, some bacterial diseases, it's not the bacterium that you're afraid of, it's actually the toxin that it makes that takes you out, like in diphtheria or in tetanus, right? It's all about the toxins that those guys are producing. Now, toxoid is basically an inactivated toxin. That's all that it is. You take the toxin from the bacterium, and then you heat treat it, so you basically inactivate the toxin. And at that point, it's called a toxoid, and you use the toxoid in the actual vaccine. Now, you inject the toxoid into your body, and your body will make antibodies against the toxoid. But just like with the inactivated vaccines, those toxoids are not what? They're not replicating in your body, makes sense? Which means they also stimulate what? A weakened immune response, right? This is also why if you get a toxoid vaccine, like the ones that go ahead and appear, yeah. So against tetanus, right, your tetanus shot, or your diphtheria shot, basically DTAB, we'll talk about that in a minute. You need boosters of them, make sense? In other words, whenever you get a vaccine that stimulates a weakened immune response, you need booster shots, right, to get the maximum immune response. Why? Because they're not growing in you, got it? That's the take on picture. Does it make sense so far? Some of y'all look bored in here, trying to help you. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. And I just talked about that, right? Why? Because they're not growing. They're not growing in you. So that's why you need booster shots, right? Booster shots. Now, combination vaccines are just that. They have combinations of different antigens or combinations of different bacteria. For example, MMR, what does that stand for? So it's mumps, measles, and rubella, okay? So you got three in one, right? Three in one. What's DTAP? Diphtheria. Diphtheria, tetanus, and what's the P guy? Pneumonia? Nope. No. Pertussis. Pertussis. Pertussis, okay? So DTAP is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Basically, you got three in one. That's it. They're a combination of vaccines. Now, some vaccines are actually used with recombinant gene technology. Why do we do this? It's a way to make vaccines real cheap and more safe, cost effective. Here are the several ways you can make vaccines as a result of recombinant gene technology, okay? A, you can take a pathogen, and if it's a pathogen, it has what? Virulence factors, right? Which means
genes, it has virulent genes. Far so good? Yeah, that's why it's a pathogen. It has virulent genes to make it virulent. Well, you can go into a virus or even to a bacterium, go into its DNA and take out the virulent genes altogether. Now, if you take out the virulent genes, guess what? You have made that pathogen a virulent, right? Which means, A, it can still stimulate an immune response, right? It sure can, but it can no longer make you sick. So it's, all, it's almost like an attenuated vaccine, except now it really can't make you sick because you have deleted the ability for that microbe or virus to make you sick. So far, so good? Because you take away, you've taken away the virulence factors itself. So it's alive, but it can't make you sick. You, it lost the ability. On this one here, you can use either bacteria or yeast to mass produce large amounts of, keyword, antibodies or even antigens. Why do we do this? It's real cheap, okay? Because later on we'll talk about how we used to get antibodies basically from other people or horses. That's not cheap to do. But you can use bacteria because they don't take a long time to grow, right? And they don't eat very much, correct? You can use yeast as well, same dishes, right? Yeast grows very quickly and it costs little money to maintain them so you can mass produce antibodies or even antigens and bacterial yeast to inject in you, okay? And lastly, you can basically alter the bacteria or alter the virus so that it cannot make you sick again. So it's not taking out the gene, for example. How can I put it? For example, hmm, let's say a particular bacterium absolutely needs its pili to make you sick. What are pili? What are pili? Okay, so they're used for attachment, right? So pili are basically attachment guys. Hmm? I thought those were fembrae. They are the same thing. Okay. Yeah, because they are exactly the same. A conjugation pilus is simply that. It's a pilus used for conjugation. Okay. I the thought they are pili. Okay. They're used for attachment. So some bacteria, like gonorrhea and Neisseria, they need their pili to attach <coughs> to your cells. But if you remove the pili, they can attach to your cells, which means they can't make you sick. So that's how you genetically alter the bacteria. Make sense? To actually genetically alter it so it can make you sick. It can't attach to your cell. It can make you sick. Now, in that, in that case there, it's also live, right? It's alive, but it can't make you sick. So it's another way of making what? An attenuated vaccine. Attenuated means what? It's live, but it's a weakened form of it. it really, it's not supposed to make you sick. This is sort of like the same as avirulence, isn't it? Right, it's avirulent, right? Exactly. Avirulent means can't There's make you sick. another way of doing it. Exactly, but it's still alive. Very good. All right. Now, how do you produce vaccines, okay? If you're making vaccines against bacteria, for example, you just grow up bacteria and cultures. It's real simple. However, y'all listen up. I'm telling you right now, I'm getting frustrated. I'm gonna be straight up. In my syllabus, I clearly state no cell phone use. And if you want, I can go into Angel right now. We got plenty of time. I'm only doing 17 half of it. Okay. I'm gonna go into Angel and pull up my syllabus as a reminder. And I say no cell phone use, including texting. I also said the very first day of class, I used to teach what? High school. High school. And guess what? They are far advanced than you, okay? They do all kinds of things with their cell phone you wouldn't even imagine, okay? So I've seen it all. Now, why do I say that? It's not because I'm strict. No, it's because I want you to learn, right? I'm being frank. I want you to learn. Because some of you aren't doing as well as you would like. And you know why? You're probably texting in class. And I'll tell you what, if you're texting in class, you are not listening to a bit of word I'm saying. It's impossible. I don't care how good you are, right? So I'm just trying to be frank and honest, okay? If you want to succeed, I can stand on my head and do a dance and present it in all kinds of ways, right? But if you're texting, it's not going to make a bit of sense, okay? So I'm not going to call you out because I'm not going to embarrass you like that. But I tell you what, I see everything. Why? I got four eyes and I taught high school students who basically put their hand in their pocket, and that's what they're doing, literally. I don't know how they do it, but that's what they're doing, okay? They're texting in their pocket. Get it. And we had to take pictures and record. Oh, that's absolute. But if you're doing this, you're not taking a picture, right? You're taking pictures. 
No, you no, you can take a picture of lecture or record me, right? Well, what else I got for? But I'm talking about texting, right? I'm talking about texting. Texting is bad because you're not listening to me. Make sense? So I'm gonna make that last announcement. And according to my syllabus, I can ask you to leave. I'm just being honest, okay? Straight up. So far so good? We're on the same page? Alright. Again, it's in my syllabus. I'll tell you right now. Anything in any professor's syllabus is backed up by the dean. If we have it in writing, it's backed up by the person upstairs. Okay. So help y'all to succeed in here. After the meeting, right? How do you make your vaccines, okay? Now here's the deal. If you have a virus, right? Viruses cannot grow outside of a cell, which means you need a cell to actually grow that virus in order to do what? Make the vaccine against it. So many, many viruses are propagated in eggs. Okay. You learned that, I think, in chapter 13, correct? You use eggs to propagate vaccines for viruses. So here's the deal. If you are, what, allergic to eggs, right, you can never, ever get a vaccine with the virus that was actually propagated in an egg. Because you're going to react to the egg proteins in that vaccine. And that's not good, okay? So if you're allergic to eggs, you better tell your doctor that, right? Because they know which vaccines have been used with eggs. They know. And you don't want to get that because you can go into anaphylactic shock, literally. Literally. All right. Now why am I showing you this? This is basically the CDC's recommended, right? In other words, you don't have to, right? You don't have to be immunized. But this is their recommended immunization schedule, okay? But what's the take-home message here? You're like, why am I learning this? Basically, if everybody, right, were to follow this schedule in terms of when to get all their vaccinations, correct? We basically develop something called herd immunity. That's H-E-R-D, okay? So in other words, if everyone follows this schedule in terms of when you get immunizations, we actually develop something called herd immunity. What is that? Herd means what? Community, group of people, animals, right? So if more than, let's say at least, at least, if 75% of the population is immunized against one pathogen, then basically everybody, the other 25% that never got immunized, they also benefit. Does that make sense so far? Now why is that? Let me ask you that. Why is that true? If 75% of people in a given population are immunized against some pathogen, then the other 25% are also protected, even though they never got the immunization. Faye? Because they, the people who got the, the shots never got the disease, so how can they pass it on? More than that, you're right. So you're on the right track. So Faye said the, person, the people who got immunized they never get the disease, so they never can pass it on. But more than that, let's see, Israel? Is it because it just stops there? What do you mean, what stops there? Like the, the virus or the pathogen just stops with those people that are immunized? You're on the right track. So think of it this way. If 75% of the people are immunized against a pathogen, it's really hard for the pathogen to find a what? A host, right? It's hard for the pathogen to find a host, which means now everybody gets the benefit. Yeah. But don't those viruses or pathogens, like after they've been immunized or whatever, like don't they come back stronger? That's where we get superbugs from, like MRSA? No, you're thinking about antibiotic resistances, and they come from the misuse of antibiotics. Strictly misuse of antibiotics? Misuse of antibiotics. It's not because of the amount of immunization. It's due to misuse of antibiotics. They just get more stronger against antibiotics you've been misusing in the first place. Uh, <laughs> Tabby? I'm sure I'm not going to say this right, but what is vaccine resistance? Is that like a varicella? It causes chickenpox and shingles. There is now a vaccine for it. Not back in the day. I never got it. It wasn't available. I've never had a chicken. Well, you should get that vaccine. <laughs> oh, no, you don't want chicken pox. She's lying. Okay. Yeah. Mama said you've had it, so you're okay. I'm telling you, if you never had chicken pox, you uh, need to get that vaccine. I'm telling you, you need to get it. It's of course on If you. you're an adult, it's three times. Yeah. It's 175. What's that, Faye? The varicella vaccine, I just got it. You have to put it in a lot three times, so you get it every three months. And then your insurance won't cover it. It's ridiculous. 175. 
but it's worth but it. It's worth it, it's worth it because it's worth it because that virus as a child causes chicken pox, which is mild, but as an adult causes shingle, which is a nightmare. Yes. It's a nightmare. It's very painful and it lasts a very long time. It's a very painful disease as an adult. So you should get that vaccine. Even though it comes out of pocket, you should get it. Because you don't want to get shingles. You don't want that. It's a very painful disease. But do we understand the concept of herd immunity? Yes. So this is why yeah. we should all kind of follow our little schedule so that the other 25% who don't want to do it, they get protected too. Martine? Do you think um, you said seventy-five percent of the population get the vaccine, that's mean that would make you know them more resistant to the pathogen, right? Say the last part again. If they if seventy five percent you know of the population get the uh, get the vaccine, that's mean they will be more uh, resistant to the uh, no, no, no. And same thing as Israel was saying, when you think about resistance like MRSA or MRSA, that's against antibiotics. That's something totally different. We're talking about immunity in your body. That's a whole different concept altogether. This just means if many people in the population are immunized against, let's say, chicken pox, right, then you hardly ever see chicken pox anymore, right? So basically, think of it this way. Chicken pox used to be a very common disease not that long ago, right? Not that long ago, I had chicken pox. If you were a kid back in the 80s, you got chicken pox, right? But nowadays, children don't get chicken pox anymore. Why? Because they have all been, what, vaccinated, and it's harder for that virus to find a host, which means it's still around, right? You just hardly ever see it anymore. Make sense? So it's called what? Herd immunity. Because now children get immunized against chicken pox where we did not. And we got it. Alright. Now, what is this one showing? It's real 